Hi, my name is Chris Salvino. I'm the trauma director at uh, Havasu Regional Medical Center. We're going to be talking about spine trauma today. Our agenda for today includes some case presentations and then a formal lecture that will talk about the following different sections in our introduction, anatomy and physiology, pathophysiology, assessment, and then management of the spinal injured patient. So let's talk about some cases. These are all cases that have happened within Arizona. This first case is a 58-year-old male, unrestrained MVA, rolled his truck. His airbag deployed, his seatbelts were defective and broke. He was complaining primarily of back pain. In the field, he had a Glasgow Coma Scale 15. His vitals, except for his pulse, were fairly unremarkable. His pulse was 150, presumed atrial fibrillation, which he had a history from. He had abrasions to his face, bruising to the chest. His back was not visualized. He was placed in a seat collar backboard and transported by typical protocol. He refused air transport, so his ground time was about 33 to 35 minutes. Upon arrival in the ER, his pulse had come down a little bit to 114. His vitals were stable. He had lumbar pain and palpation. His neurological exam was otherwise unremarkable. Spinal precautions were continued. He had a history of atrial fibrillation and a cabbage in the past. His lab tests, for the most part, were unremarkable. He had atrial fibrillation as EKG. He was placed initially in a cardiac bolus and a drip to get his heart rate down. And then he underwent imaging, and I'll show you the positive images. For all these cases, I will not show you the negatives, just the positives. Uh, CAT scan of his lumbar spine right in this area revealed a pretty significant L2 compression fracture. You could see that typically the lumbar spine is supposed to be rectangular, and this is compressed and moved forward and backward. On a horizontal cut, you can see the fracture through the body of the L2 vertebrae right there. And here's an AP view, too. So it's a pretty good L2 fracture. The MRI uh, is negative for injury to the cord, but this title here is a little misleading. It does show a bony fracture. When there's a bony fracture on an MRI, typically the fractured bone will show up as a white haze. So this is the area of the L2 body fracture right in here. The cord itself is normal. From a hospital course point of view, he was admitted to the ICU for observation for his atrial fibrillation. He had a cardiac consult for the history of AFib. His medications controlled his heart rate, and this became a non-issue. For an L2 issue, he was placed in a TLSO brace, began in physical therapy, and spent two days in the hospital. He was then sent home after two days with a predicted course of six to eight weeks in the TLSO brace, and he'll be following up with the neurosurgeon in the office. This typically will heal without an issue. He'll be, the precautions here will be no bending and no sports until it does heal. That's case one. Second case was a 27-year-old male in a high-speed motorcycle accident. He was placed in a collar in the field. He was intubated. He was moving off four extremities prior to intubation. He was hypotensive in the field. Hypotension uh, could be from a number of things. The most likely source is typically blood loss, but there are other reasons. He had an ultrasound showing fluid in his abdomen and plain film showing a femur fracture. Because of the fluid in his abdomen and he was hypotensive, he went to surgery, and in surgery, they found a small bowel, or I found a small bowel injury that which was repaired. The small bowel tear had actually caused fluid to leak out, which was what was seen on ultrasound. The ultrasound again showed fluid, and the hypotension led to him going straight to the OR. He subsequently also underwent a femur repair. And from a neurological point of view, remember it was a high-speed motorcycle accident. He had a CT scan of the brain, and as the alcohol wore off, he woke up. And the CT scan of his thoracic lumbar spine was unremarkable. But his CT scan of his neck was very impressive for a C0 on a C1 dislocation. This is the bottom of the skull called C0. This is a ball and socket joint. This should be over here. And the space between the, the C0 and C1 should be about a millimeter. So again, the bottom of the skull, the connection is called C0. That's C1. This is out of its socket, so it's dislocated. In order to dislocate uh, a, a, the upper part of the, of the brain, I'm sorry, the upper part of the skull from the spinal cord, it takes a lot of force. Now, this is an MRI, which is a pretty interesting MRI. 
The spinal cord is the grayer area. The spinal fluid, for the most part, is the lighter area. And right in the area of the dislocation, there is a lack of spinal fluid going around the spinal cord, and it looks like there's a little congestion here, which is consistent with some swelling and hemorrhage. This is a schematic showing the ligaments that attach the skull here to the cervical spine, and there's a fair number of ligaments in here that in this case were disrupted. This also shows the, the um, area of the spine, and this is actually in an anatomic model. This is in a cadaver showing bones, and this is bones here, a fracture here. And I'll show you later, this gentleman actually ended up having screws that went from the bottom of the skull through C1. So this is a screw that goes from C1 here into the bottom of the skull. So um, he ended up for repair having four screws from basically C1 to C2 and C2 to C1. This should be C0 to C1. So technically he had a screw on the left and right from C0 to C1 and from C1 to C2. This gray area is bone matrix, which was ground up bone. And he also had a plate placed back here for stabilization. The whole idea was to stabilize the bones uh, because the ligaments were all torn. And he was placed in a halo until the repair was stabilized. That's a picture of him in the halo. As far as follow-up, he was not from the United States. He was transitioned back to his home country with a halo on. He was expected to stay in the halo for three months and would need subsequent CAT scan imaging to see that the bones were healing. Uh, due to the fact that he had basically had a repair and stabilization, this would limit his future movement to 90 degree rotation and decrease flexion. But if they hadn't done this, he probably would end up with a complete quadriplegia from this and died. It was a great save, actually, because a gentleman who normally could have ended up with quadriplegia was salvaged and should be up walking around at this point in time in his life. The next case was an older male, fell off a six-foot ledge. He was transferred from the field to a small hospital, and he had a complex past medical history and suspected multiple injuries, so he was transferred to us. On physical in the ER, his vital signs are remarkable. His Glasgow Coma Scale is 15. He had multiple abrasions, but the main thing he had was generalized spinal discomfort. Of note, he had coronary artery disease, hypertension, renal failure, and was being dialyzed. He had multiple medications, and including the dialysis, and his BUN and creatinine were elevated upon arrival due to his BUN and creatinine and his renal failure. As far as x-rays go, he had a negative chest x-ray, pelvis, femur, and a CAT scan of the abdomen, so let's see what his positive films were. He had a left small subdural here and a C1 burst fracture. And as we'll show coming up, C1 is a ring. It's the only spinal bone that actually is a ring uh, for the most part in all the way around. And a ring, when it breaks, usually breaks in more than one spot. So C1 goes around in a circle like this. This is the middle of C2 or the top of C2. C1 is broken here and here. So again, a ring, when it's the bone, like a, the pelvis is a ring. Typically, when the pelvis breaks along the ring itself, it breaks in two places or more. And again, that's what we're seeing here with C1. His body of C2 has got a crack in it too, right here. And laterally, he has spinous process fractures, and we'll show what these are later when we get into the actual lecture. But these are fractures of the bone in the back. You can see them here, 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 and here. So he broke C3 through C7 spinous process fractures. And on CAT scan, if you look really closely, the spinal cord is the darker gray. This whiter area here, lighter area, is actually a hematoma seen better on MRI, but actually you could see it on the CAT scan. So he has a cervical epidural hematoma, and that has pushed his spinal cord from this side to this side. So in summary, that simple little fall in an elder, not so much an elderly, but an upper middle aged person, but however, does have a multiple medical problems, including uh, dialysis. He has a small subdural, 
a C1 burst fracture of the cord epidural hematoma, C2 body fracture, and spinous process fractures down here. Uh, his hospital course is complicated. He had 50 days, 52 days in the hospital. His brain subdural did not worsen, and he was mentating normally, so this, this did not warrant surgery. This was watched. His cervical fractures, ironically, were fairly stable in a cervical collar, and he remained on renal dialysis the same amount that he would have as an outpatient. The reason he stepped, stayed in the hospital is he developed an incidental osteomyelitis, or an infection of his bone, at T12 L1. So he developed an infection, and workup eventually revealed a very unusual infection of the spinal bone itself. And that's down here. The whitish area is the infection itself. And here's the infection here. This is a needle on CAT scan going from the back. This patient's on his stomach. Going from the back into the area in question, sampling the fluid for bacteria. So he was on a number of antibiotics intravenously due to the infection, which is an unusual infection. He was discharged home in a wheelchair to go home with physical therapy and was going to follow up with a neurosurgeon. So a very unusual complication. He had no manipulation of his lower spine, but that got infected just by being in the hospital, or it could have come from his dialysis before he got to the hospital. The next case happened along the Colorado River. There was four people on this boat. We're going to talk about, I think, one patient here. Going about 75 miles an hour into a concrete wall in a cigarette boat, the patient was facing backwards. Other people were injured on board. All of them were flown out by helicopter. This was picked up by a very rural field ground team. In fact, one of the medics on the ground team, that was his first day on the job. This particular person's ground was unknown. It was really hard to get information due to the significant number of people involved. He was... Uh, the person was flown out, I think it was a she, she was flown out before she was flown out. The flight crew noted that she was not moving, and they intubated her for the fact that she was not moving, and she was stable in flight by communicating by blinking. In the ER at our facility, her blood pressure was stable. Her pulse was low, so we suspected this could be related to uh, spinal cord injury. She was opening her eyes, and she was blinking to command she had no extremity movement and no rectal tone. Her labs were normal as far as the abnormal films. She had a non-displaced, if you look closely, crack through her sternum, so she had a sternal fracture. This is probably from blunt force hitting the sternum in the front. She had a C3 fracture. You can see the crack here. This is a line of where the back of the spinal cord or the spinal column should be. And C3 is pushed backwards towards the spinal cord. So it's a teardrop fracture in the front. More than likely from a flexion injury. This is her mouth up here. So more than likely her spine went forward and got broke between C2 and C4. And, and it pushed the outer part of C3. A more impressive view is looking at C3 horizontally. It's cracked here, here, and here. Now this is also a ring like C1 a different kind of ring, but still the concept is when a ring breaks, it typically breaks in more than one spot. This doesn't look so bad, neither does this. The problem here is this ring has been pushed inwards, and this is where the spinal cord is. So this implies there's at least a compression, if not further injury to the spinal cord. She also has a C7 fracture. There's a little crack here. C6 is rectangular. This one looks trapezoid. So the front of C7 has been cracked. This also looks like a uh, flexion injury with C6, probably hitting T1 and smushing the front of C7. An MRI demonstrated a cord injury. So here's the cord. Here's the bones. Here is spinal fluid around the cord in a normal area, and the same thing down here. However, right at C3, it's narrowed. There's hemorrhage in here and there's no CSF getting around the cord. And so in summary of her injuries, her brain is normal. She had a concussion. She's quadriplegic at C3. She had a minor fracture at C7 and a non-displaced sternal fracture 
and she had persistent hypotension, which is more than likely coming from her spinal cord as opposed to blood loss. Remember, hypotension should be presumed from blood loss until proven otherwise. From an ER point of view, she received fluids. So anybody in spinal cord shock uh, should receive fluids first because they become vasodilatory and their blood vessels sort of dilate and all the fluid goes into the tissues. Then you would add a pressure, typically dopamine. And steroids are controversial. They're falling out of favor. And so most spinal cord injuries should not receive steroids. They've never been proven to be of a benefit. The neurosurgeon took her to the surgery not to change her outcome, but to prevent further damage. And he actually put an anterior plate in front of the C3 area and put a screw into C2 and C4 to stabilize this fracture area. From a supportive point of view, she had a vena cava, vena cava filter placed, which is this umbrella-like structure to catch any blood clots that would come from her legs going up to her heart and tracheostomy because a C3 uh, is a cord injury that also involves the breathing apparatus and a G2 for feeding. She spent 30 days approximately at our ICU. From a pulmonary point of view, we weaned her down to a ventilator and CPAP at night. From a GI point of view, she began tolerating some liquids by her mouth, and she had most of her nutrition going through the G-tube. The spinal cord is predicted, once you have a complete paralysis, it extremely rarely ever gets any better. So for the most part, a complete paralysis initially in the ER would imply no change permanently. From a physical therapy point of view, we, we began to get her up into a spinal cord wheelchair. And because she um, was from another state and only had access, it's difficult to get her into a rehab center in Ohio. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Consequently, we did some of her rehab in the intensive care unit. Normally, ideally, someone with a spinal cord injury we leave the hospital earlier to a formal rehab center, but this was not able to be done due to her insurance. We did the rehab in the hospital. Okay, those are four cases that have to do with spinal cord injuries or, or, or uh, spine injuries themselves. Now we're going to talk about the spine. So annually in the United States, there's about 15,000 cord injuries that are permanent. Commonly, these are males, younger age, blunt trauma typically, uh, car accidents or falls. As you can see, vehicular traffic or accidents takes up about 50% of these injuries. It's suspected that 25% of all spinal cord injuries worsen or happen from improper handling of the damaged spine or the spinal cord. And to put it in context from a money point of view, each patient with a true spinal cord injury, like a quadriplegic or paraplegic uh, the lifetime care costs at least a million dollars, which is understandable, especially for quadriplegic patients. And the best form of care is public safety and prevention programs. The anatomy consists of 33 bones in the spine itself. The function is basically skeletal su su support. It also protects the spinal cord by surrounding the spinal cord with bone. So basically, for the most part, the spinal cord is in the middle of the bone all the way up and down. So that's sort of its suit of armor. The vertebral body is the major weight-bearing component, and that's this part here. These other parts are for articulation and protection of the spinal cord. This is for where the weight-bearing force goes all the way up and down the back. The vertebral body size increases the more inferior you go. So as you go from the top to the bottom, Everything gets bigger. Let's look at the different components. The spinal uh, canal is what I've already hinted at. It's right here in the middle, and that's where the spinal cord goes through. And that is the protective device because you're surrounding the cord by bone for the most part. Pedicles are the structures that allow the, um, uh, the vertebral body to move. The lamina is also the spot where the posterior bones of the vertebral make up the foramen. And the transverse processes are these bones that stick out laterally. They don't really have a significant protected device, and they are attached with muscles and ligaments. The other 
bone that's kind of unusual is the spinal process here, which is the posterior prominence on the vertebral body. So it's similar to the transverse process, which goes horizontally. This goes vertically. This is the bone you actually feel when you touch your spinal cord. Or when you touch your spine in the back, you're feeling the spinous process. Then in between the bones themselves, there's cartilage, there's the disc, and there's the capsule that the different joints uh, are, touch, are attached to. So when you move your spine itself, you're moving these structures in here. You're moving the, the uh, disc in between. When you flex or, or extend, you're moving that disc a little bit. And the attachments are moving too, these articular surfaces. These serve as movement joints and as shock absorbers. Your body also has, in addition to the bones and the uh, things we just talked about, you have ligaments. You have ligaments in front of the spinal cord and ligaments in the back. These ligaments help hold everything together and help with articulation. Now we're going to break the spine itself down into its three different areas or four different areas. The cervical spine has seven vertebral uh, bodies itself. It's the sole support for the head, and the head weighs between 16 and 22 pounds in adults. The C1 is probably the most unusual bone, and it's for the most part a ring. It supports the head itself onto the cervical spine, and it's affixed to the bottom of the skull at C0, otherwise known as the occiput. So the bottom of the skull, C0, attaches through ligaments to C1, and it permits your head to move and rotate for the most part. The C2 is the other unusual bone in the body, and that's the axis. It has an unusual ball. It has like a, a, a spike that sticks vertically, and that allows C0, C1 to rotate onto C2. So C2 has the dens, which sticks up straight, and that sticks in between uh, C0, I'm sorry, C1. The thoracic spine, they're, all those thoracic spines look, look about the same. They get a little bit bigger as you go farther distally. There's 12 vertebral bodies here. The unusual thing about the thoracic spine is the ribs attached to the vertebral bodies, which does not happen in the neck or the lumbar spine. There's, again, longer, larger and stronger bones as you go further distally, and there's a lot of muscles and ligaments to hold things together. The lumbar spine is composed of five vertebral bodies. They're bigger than the thoracic spine typically. They bear forces of bending and lifting in the area of the pelvis. And the, again, these are the largest and thickest vertebral bodies. They're different from the thoracic spine in that there's no ribs attached to this area either. The sacral spine down here is really five fused vertebrae. They form a posterior plate of the pelvis. So the posterior plate of the pelvis is back in here. They're actually a protective area. They help protect from injury to the re urinary and reproductive and uh, other types of organs in the pelvis. And they attach the spine itself to the pelvis, so it's sort of a junction area here. The coccyx is kind of a remnant of your tail. It's three to five vertebral body. Now let's look at the spinal cord and its coverings. The spinal cord has layers, the dura mater, which is right out here, the arachnoid and the pia mater, and they cover the internal spinal cord and the nerve roots as they exit from the spinal cord itself. Cerebral spinal fluid is also in this area, and the cerebral spinal fluid bays the spinal cord by filling the subarachnoid space. So the subarachnoid space right here is filled with CSF and helps bathe the spinal cord. The sp spinal cord has a number of functions. One of its biggest ones is it's a shock absorber. The function of the spinal cord is it transmits sensory inputs from the body to the brain, and it conducts motor impulses from the muscles to the organs from the brain itself. It also has a reflex center that uh, intercepts signals from the body and initiates a reflex that would take place without even the sensory input going to the brain itself. There are 31 pairs of nerves that originate along the spinal cord from each of the vertebral bodies. 
There's anterior and posterior nerve roots, and they come together. These nerve roots serve both sensory, where you feel like hot or cold or pain, and motor function by going out to the muscles of the body itself and making things move. There are certain areas of the body in which the nerves that come out of the spinal cord come together and merge into a, what's called a plexus, kind of a big mush of nerves itself. And these plexuses do different things. There's really three. There's the cervical plexus of C3, 4, and 5. And those join together to create a nerve that controls the diaphragm. Then there's a number of nerves that come out of the cervical spine itself. And the cervical, I'm sorry, the in cervical spine and upper thoracic spine, this creates the brachial plexus. And the brachial plexus controls movement and sensation to the upper extremity. There's also one lower down, and the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus are down in this area. So I, I was incorrect when I stated there was three. There's actually four different plexuses. Cervical that controls the diaphragm, brachial that controls the arm, and then lumbar and sacral for the lower extremities. There are also um, ways of looking at how the body performs when it comes neurologically at the uh, skin level. So there are different nerves that control sensation of the skin. That's a topographical region. For example, C7 gives you sensation to your little finger right there. And they follow different functions. The sensation is different from the motor itself. So C7... Again, it controls the little fingers. S1 controls the, the uh, toe. Myotomes are muscles that are innervated by a specific spinal nerve root. For example, arm extension comes from C5, and ankle flexion comes from S1. So dermatomes are about the skin. Myotomes are about the muscle control. We mentioned reflex earlier. Reflex is when uh, uh, a Input from the nerve goes upstream but does not make it all the way to the brain and it creates a motor movement. So that's the body's way of having a very quick movement in case something happens. For example, you put your finger on a hot iron and it sends a signal, that sensation of pain sends a signal and temperature from your fingertip into your spinal cord and then it goes back down to your finger and makes you move your finger off the hot device without it always going to your brain first. So reflexes take place before the sensation actually gets to your brain. You're going to feel it later, but by the time you feel it in your brain, you already moved your hand. Then there are different kind of groupings of nervous systems. The autonomic, autonomic nervous system is a parasympathetic nervous system. Its major function is to slow the heart rate. It's kind of used when you're laying around or eating food, you want to increase your digestive system activity and it again slows your heart rate. The one you probably heard of most is the sympathetic one or called a fight and flight response. Its major functions are to increase metabolic rate. When that happens, you direct blood out of your GI tract to your extremities and epinephrine is released. So this one is the opposite of this one. The best example is the fight or flight. You might see, for example, a bear when you're walking down a path, you're going to get frightened. Your epinephrine, ep epinephrine uh, levels go up, your heart rate goes up, your cardiac output goes up, and you become more aware and, and you can then uh, run or get away from the danger. So that's the sympathetic and that's the parasympathetic nervous system functions. The spine is blessed with the fact that it has a number of different ways blood gets to the spinal cord because if there's only one artery and it was compromised, you could kill the spinal cord just by knocking off that one artery. You don't need to know the names of these arteries, but if you could just imagine that blood can get to the spinal cord from a number of different sources and they are overlapping in, in general. And here's another way of looking at just horizontally. So if you pick any vertebrae and move it over here, there's a blood supply basically surrounding this whole entire spinal cord itself, and it also goes up vertically. The take-home message here is if that particular artery right here was injured, the spinal cord would be fine because it has other areas to receive blood from. Now let's talk about mechanisms of injury. 
These are kind of extremes. They could be a hyperextension, a hyperflexion, a rotation injury, a bending injury, or like the one gentleman I showed you with the C1 fracture, which he probably landed on his head when he fell off the wall. That could be an axial loading, which you hit the top of your head typically, and the load goes down your spinal cord, creating fractures or injuries. There's also distraction, which is the opposite direction in which you pull things apart. All these are blunt trauma types of mechanisms of injury. And then there's penetrating trauma, which is less common to the spinal cord than blunt trauma. When you look a little bit closer to different types of injuries, those injuries that can happen to the column itself, that can be a subluxation or a dislocation, a subluxation. It could be where you go forward and you move your cord off of another bone. For example, C6 on C7 could be moved to the point where C6 is subluxed or comes up and off C7, and it's basically a dislocation. There are fractures that take, could take place. You can rupture the vertebral disc that is in between the vertebral bodies. And then I think the more important thing is to understand that there are sites of injury that are common, and they are there for different reasons. The bottom of the skull and C1, C2 is a delicate area. C1 and C2 are fairly delicate vertebral bodies, and they frequently get injured because of the, the, their delicate nature. Plus, the, as we mentioned earlier, the, the skull and brain weigh about 18 to 22 pounds. So the brain up here on top of these fragile uh, C1, C2, you can see why C1, C2 could be damaged because they're fragile and they are going up against tremendous amount of weight and force through the head itself. C7, T1 is an area of common fracture because that's a transition from the delicate cervical spine with no ribs attaching to the thoracic spine with ribs. So that is an area of, of um, common fractures. And by the same token, same thing happens from T6 or T12 to L1. You're going from a thoracic spine that's very common because it all has ribs attached to L1, which has no ribs. So that's a common area of, of fracture. So due to different types of anatomy and forces, commonly injured areas are the top of C1, C2, the cervical spine and thoracic spine junction, and the thoracic spine and lumbar spine junction. Now let's talk about the cord itself. That, the last couple of slides are about the bones. You can have injuries as follows. A concussion can happen in the spinal cord just like the brain. You can get, if you get knocked out, uh, that's a concussion of your brain. If you have a transient disruption of your spinal cord, for example, uh, you, you're in a football accident, you're playing football, and all of a sudden you have a weak arm and it comes back within an hour or two, that's more like a, a concussion because it's come back fairly quickly. And if you were to do an MRI, by definition, if you did an MRI of this temporary phenomenon, you should see no cord damage. Because like in the brain, if you do a CAT scan of the brain, and there's no damage to the, spinal, to the brain itself seen on CAT scan, but the person was knocked out, that's a concussion. If you damage the brain, not only were they knocked out, but there's blood in the brain, that's more than a concussion. So a concussion is more of a non-radiographic finding in which there's a transient disruption of cord function that would come back fairly quickly. A contusion of the spinal cord is a bruise to the spinal cord, which would have more longer lasting issues with the cord, but typically not permanent damage. A compression of the spinal cord can happen from intervertebral disc injuries or bone and dislocation fractures, causing swelling or hemorrhage or movement, compressing the spinal cord itself. A minor one typically will result in that person getting better. A severe one, which I showed you, like the female that was in that boating accident, the compression was so bad that it knocked off the blood supply in that area, causing permanent damage. Lacerations to the spinal cord are not common. Uh, if it happens, it can come from bony fragments being driven into the vertebral foramen. And then hemorrhage can come from a number of different things. That can be from a contusion, a laceration, or stretching. These are all different types of injuries that can happen to the cord itself, from something as minor as a, more like a concussion to something major that could be permanent and complete. Speaking of complete, a complete transaction of the spinal cord uh, can, that will result obviously in complete function loss, 
below the area of injury. If it happens in the cervical spine, that's quadriplegia. Below T1, that's paraplegia. If it involves the nerves of C3, 4, and 5, C3, 4, and 5 collectively affect respiration. So a C3 complete cord, that person cannot breathe on their own. A C6 cord injury does not involve the diaphragm, so that it should not involve the respiratory system. General signs and symptoms of injury could ex include extremity paralysis or breathing problems, pain with or without movement. Tenderness is a tough one because people get tenderness just from the accident in general or laying on a board, but you can have tenderness along the spine. As I mentioned, impaired breathing. Uh, this is one you're not going to feel that often is actual spinal deformity. That's a really bad injury. So that's basically kind of a rarity. And then there's loss of bowel or bladder control. I think the top three, the top things here really should be a patient that's complaining of numbness or weakness in their extremities or someone who has pain or movement. Pain or movement would um, also potentially imply a spinal cord injured patient. And don't forget, there could be lack of symptoms too. Someone who's been intoxicated in a car accident you should assume there's a spinal cord injury until proven otherwise because their sensation of pain goes away. Now let's talk about uh, spinal injuries that also can lead to physiological problems. Spinal shock is an in insult to the cord, only not to the brain, and it affects the body below the level of injury. It can affect sensation and movement, but they typically also get hypotension because the patient then vasodilates. They lose their ability to construct their blood vessels. Their blood vessels dilate. The fluid goes out of their blood vessels into their extremities. And because of that, they get hypotension. Key thing here for spinal shock is the heart rate is not normally affected. Neurogenic shock, also called spinal vascular shock, occurs when the injury to the spinal cord disrupts the brain's ability to control the body. So they also get, like the last slide, Sympathetic loss, so their blood vessels, arteries, and veins dilate. They expand their vascular space, which means the fluid leaks out of your vascular space into your tissues, and that results in hypotension, and this reduces cardiac preload. So basically, the fluid goes out of their blood vessels and into their extremities, and they, go, they get hypotensive. In addition, the patient can no longer control their heart rate because of the ability of, of, of the disruption of the... Um, the uh, neuroepinephrine system, and consequently, you get bradycardia. So going back one slide, spinal shock, hypotension, plus normal heart rate. Spinal vascular or neurogenic shock is hypotension plus bradycardia. And typically, when you treat these things, you have to treat both, which we'll talk about in a little bit. From a field assessment point of view, this is all something everybody's been through. It's important that the field understands the mechanism of injury and relays this to the physicians to maintain inline control. Uh, it's okay to evaluate the spinal system as long as you maintain inline control. Steroids, from a, from a treatment point of view, are basically out of favor. They've not been shown, as I mentioned earlier, any improvement to spinal cord injured patients. Here's some practical things. Medications and neurogenic or spinal shock. Someone in spinal shock or neurogenic shock is going to have a low blood pressure because of the dilation we talked about. So the first and most important step, whether it's the field of the ER, is a fluid challenge. They typically need isotonic solutions such as saline and typically more than normal, three, four, five liters to sort of get their tank back and refilled to refill their vascular system with fluid. This has really fallen out of favor. There's probably no one still carries mass trousers for this particular reason. If you still carry them, research has shown no improvement in spinal or neurogenic shock with mass trousers on. Second line of defense is pressors. Dopamine is a good one because it raises the heart rate when needed in addition to the blood pressure. If someone has low heart rate, you could also use atropine as a temporary measure before the dopamine started. So the big issue here is someone who's, in, who's got uh, hypotension should be given fluids first, followed by uh, pressors if needed.
The other important thing is to remember that anybody who's hypotensive from trauma, most of the time it's from blood loss. So the diagnosis of shock from the spinal cord should be a diagnosis of exclusion. You should need to make sure that there's no bleeding going on, going on inside the torso or the extremities before you assume the hypotension is coming from the spine. Medications on the combative patient. In this case, it's, more, it's very important to protect the spinal cord and the brain, so you may have to reduce or may have to add sedatives to reduce anxiety and calm the patient to prevent further spinal injury. And you should also then consider, when necessary, paralytics with airway control. It's better to have someone intubated, paralyzed with spinal control than someone jumping off the bed, potentially could take a bony injury only and turn it into a cord injury. So in summary from this presentation, we've gone over four cases that have had different types of spine injuries plus some cord injuries. The lectures included topics. To, we've introduced the spinal cord itself, talked about anatomy, physiology, pathophysi pathophysiology of spinal injuries, and then gone through assessment and management of the spinal cord injured patient and the spinally injured patient itself. I want to thank you for your time, and I hope you have a good day. And for fun, here's a, an end slide that basically says it's probably just something you picked up at the office when it comes to a knife in the back. Thank you again for your time.